So welcome back, Ottolinos. We are here for the last episode of Clima Ottolina, which is the series of Ottolina TV dedicated to climate change and energy transition. So we are here now with Vijay Prashad, which is the director of Tricontinental Institute of Research. So welcome. BJ and thank you for accepting our invitation. Well, firstly, thank you so much for talking to me in English. Um, again, <laughs> you know, language is a real thing and it's a democratic thing and it's always a challenge. We always treat English as our bridge language, don't we? So, yeah, thanks a lot for that. Yes, uh, we don't like very much to talk in English, but we have to. <laughs> so, My first answer is about your speech at COP26, because in this speech you say you, don't, you shouldn't worry about the future, but you should worry about the present. So what did you mean? Yeah, so, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, well, we're not going to have a future and, and so on, and, and in the... Richer countries of the world, people say things like, you know, children won't have the kind of life that um, the parents, um, the parents had, had, and so on. There's this, this sort, sort of belief, belief that, that somehow things are, um, were okay maybe in the near past. Maybe they're just okay in the, in the present, but they're going to be terrible in the future. And if we don't do something about climate change now, then the future is impossible. That's an attitude. And that attitude, I think, is, is a very poor attitude because it mischaracterizes the situation for billions of people now. You know, I mean, even on the question of climate change, there are already people who are suffering the negative impacts of catastrophic climate. You know, there are already people whose um, lives are being taken over by the fact that you're getting flooding, rain, fires and so on um, at inappropriate periods in the cycle of, of, of the harvest or the cycle of, of everyday, you know, or annual life. So there's that, there's that itself, which is that the catastrophes of climate change are already on the table. But beyond that, you know, there's an, another attitude which says that, look, you know, <clears throat> the climate catastrophe is there, everything must be done Um, to take care of it, which means maybe we need to consume less. And that is an unfortunate attitude. You know, I was recently talking to a, um, a very sincere, nice man from one of the richer countries of the world who was saying to me, look, I recognize that it's mainly consumption in the global north that is fueling the climate catastrophe. I recognize that. And he said, but, you know, wouldn't it be good if women in the global south were more educated, so they had less children. And I thought, what are you talking about? You're an educated person. You just said something so stupid to me. You said to me that the problem is in consumption in the north, but let's force women in the south to have education in order not to have so many children. How is that going to solve the problem of overconsumption in the north? There's this attitude, you know, that, Well, the solutions are somewhere else. The solutions are for the future or the solutions are in another country. You know, the solutions are in China or India or Brazil. But the solution is not in Italy or in the U United States and so on, where consumption levels are very high. Even in these countries, consumption levels are by class. You know, um, you can't tell poor people, don't eat more. Uh, you see, you're eating too much. In fact, it's interesting. There have been studies done of this. People have looked at waste in different neighborhoods in richer countries. And in the poorer neighborhoods, there's less garbage per capita produced than in the richer neighborhoods. In a richer neighborhood, you cook a lot more food. If you don't eat it, you throw it away. In a poorer neighborhood, you cook less food per capita and you eat everything because you're basically hungry a lot. Um, you don't throw away so much. So there's a lot of actual things underneath that sentiment that, look, it's about the now. 
It's about the now for poorer people all over the world. It's about the now for the poorer countries all around the world. And it's, a, it's about the now because the solutions aren't going to happen if India burns less coal. If India today stopped burning all coal, it would not, it would barely influence the impact of temperature rise. It's not India that's increasing temperature rise. Um, it's the consumption levels of the global north, including the wars of the global north. You know, the largest institutional polluter in the world is the U.S. military. But that is never really discussed. My Lord. And so I want to... I want to have a, a step back with you. We are back to 1992, to the Rio summit. In this summit, all the countries, all the government agreed on the idea of common but differentiated responsibilities, which, which is a specific reference to the idea, to the fact that some countries has benefited more from, from colonialism and from fossil fuels from century, for, for centuries. And so now they have bigger responsibilities in decarbonizing. So my, my question is, uh, can you explain to us uh, how this uh, Western-based and fossil fuel-based capitalism has contributed both to inequality and to climate crisis? Well, that conference, the Conference on Environment in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil in 1992 is a very important conference. Um, anybody wants a quick, you know, indicator of what that conference was like, I highly recommend um, going and reading Fidel Castro's speech to that conference where Castro talked about um, the question of environmental destruction and how capitalism basically puts a zero price on nature, you know, essentially externalizes all costs to nature. You have a factory that produces chickens, you know, you slaughter chickens, you throw the blood, the guts, the fat all into rivers, and you let nature deal with the environmental crisis. You know, before we were talking about the climate crisis, we were talking about the environmental crisis, the ozone layer, um, you know, industrial crimes, um, the crimes of, of, of nuclear waste, for instance, dumped into, into uh, mountains and so on, the cr crimes of, of um, big energy companies just throwing effluents, you know, all kinds of chemicals into major rivers, poisoning fish, creating cancer for populations. That was really on the agenda in Rio in 1992. Um, the climate issue hadn't yet taken off as a, as a problem. What was there on the table was the ozone layer, which is to say that because of freon gas, excessive use of freon gas and other things, the layer that protects um, the planet from the sun was being eroded. And you were getting incredible um, heat through the ozone cracks. So that was the agenda at Rio. There was a robust debate at that conference, very important debate. In the debate, uh, there were various lines of argumentation. One was to establish, and I think the United Nations Environmental Program did a very good job on this. They established that everybody was impacted by the environmental destruction and the ozone layer. Th there was nobody who could be immune from it. You can't live in a fancy house on the outskirts of Rome and not experience um, you know, the negative impact of the environmental collapse. Why? Because um, if you're going to have poisoned fish out there, you're going to, there's a good chance that inside your fancy house, you're going to have poisoned fish come in. Maybe not for you, but in the cat food for your cat. And your cat is going to die. I mean, you can't immunize yourself from the environmental collapse. The dirty air, acid rain is going to fall on your house as much as it falls on the house of the poor. So that was the reason why the word common appeared in that, um, in that agreement. Common was one of the main words. And that was, again, a lot of work done by the UN Environmental Program to make sure that people were not starting to think, well, you know, if the Amazon is cut down, that impacts Brazil. And what the UN Environmental Program said, no, no, if you cut the Amazon down, the Amazon is a major lung of the planet. You know, it, it takes in carbon 
and it exhales oxygen. Uh, if you take the Amazon, the forests in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, you know, the Papua New Guinea and, and, and East Timor, you take that region, all those forests, you cut them all down, it's going to impact everybody, not just people in Brazil or in Africa and so on. Okay, so that was common and very important. I mean, I'm going on about this because you may be surprised to learn that there was a long while where people thought this is not going to bother me. You know, it was called a not in my backyard attitude that I don't want to have a garbage incinerator in my backyard, put it in a poor part of the city. You know, we don't want a garbage dump. Okay, you can think like that when it comes to garbage or waste management, but it doesn't work like that with acid rain. You know, when the rain is going to fall, falls everywhere. Common. The second word is differentiated. This was an enormously contested word. What did that even mean to say that there's differentiated responsibilities? It's common and resp differentiated responsibility. What is differentiated? Differentiated simply meant that if you look back at all the experiences over the last 200 years, from the, in 92, 200 years before that, in other words, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, um, what did this even mean? Let's take the case of a country like India. In India, when the British were the colonial masters, um, you know, they cut down old growth trees. Why did they cut these trees down? Old growth trees, mind you, not, you know, trees that grow fast, that you can harvest the wood. They cut mahogany, old trees. To do what? When they built rail railroad lines, you know, you put the two... Um, Ingot the tracks on the line, but the tracks are held together by wooden slats, you know, bits of wood. Well, the British just cut any tree to build those slats. So you have high, you know, ancient trees cut down to build that. And why did they build railroads? To move raw materials from the coastal region to the ports so they could be taken to Manchester, Birmingham, Sheffield, and so on in England for the factories to manufacture. And then bring back uh, the finished products to sell. So it was quite clear by the 19, you know, 60s, really, um, what this had done, this, this ut over-utilization of the colonies, the destruction of the environment. I mean, there's a place in Chhattisgarh in India, a large province of India, where there's been a fire burning underneath the ground for over 150 years, okay? There used to be a coal mine there, it set on fire, and the British just abandoned it. And that fire has not been put out. It has been burning for 100 years underneath the ground. Imagine how insane that is, you know, the impact of colonialism. And the Indian government has, has been trying for decades to put the fire out, but it's now too complicated. It goes through all kinds of under uh, subterranean seams and so on. Okay. So there was a recognition by the time of Rio, but of course, many decades before, that colonialism uh, destroyed the environment in many of the places where they were in charge, in the Congo and so on, destroyed the environment, you know, many of the places. But more than that, it took the resources of that destruction and built up the wealth of their societies. So that England, for instance, just from the province of Bengal, from where I am, 30% of Britain's industrial down payment comes from Bengal. Then you add on the transatlantic slave trade, you add on the theft from Ghana and so on. You know, look, when you buy a house anywhere in the world, you have to put 10% down, maybe 20%, you know, before you get a loan from the bank. Colonialism allowed the West to get maybe 50% of the down payment by stealing from the colonies. So, you know, Differentiated refers to the inequality created as a consequence of colonialism and then also to the adverse destruction of the environment in the colonies. And when I say inequality, you have to understand what this means. It means that they also suppressed, they suppressed the standard of living of people so that people in, you know, in, in, in Western Africa, in Ghana, in India, the Caribbean, were eating less than people in the advanced or the, the richer countries. They were eating less. So their nutrition levels were lower. 
That means their actual per capita environmental footprint is lower. You see, because they're not eating meat largely because meat is too expensive. Um, meat eating only starts now in many parts of, of the world. You get it. So common and difference is a crucial concept, but it's not being followed. And least of all by the G7 countries that have basically manipulated the climate debate so that they look good. They greenwash themselves and that they put the blame for everything on the formerly colonized parts of the world. So talking about greenwashing, in the notebook that you dedicated to um, climate crisis, there is this comparison between uh, the Green New Deal mainstream proposal and an alternative Green New Deal, which is a leftist one, which is based on Buen Vivir. Can you speak about the difference between these two models? You know, the easiest example for this is transportation. I mean, that, that's just the easiest example. Um, you know, as a consequence of the internal combustion engine powered by fossil fuels, we got the automobile. Um, initially, you know, the automobile was a, was a, the car was something for very rich people. But soon, particularly after World War II, the automobile became massified. Uh, people felt that they wanted to have a car. It was a sign of being in the middle class to have cars, millions and millions of cars sold in many, many countries. Okay, so you got the automobile. Well, the automobile, although I must say, automobile uh, fossil fuel emissions, not the biggest culprit in the world, but it's one big culprit. So let's just stay with the automobile for my example. So here you have cars, and then there's an anxiety about the climate catastrophe. People come to realize the problem. So they say, well, we're going to have to maintain some kind of internal combustion engine. It's not going to be an internal combustion engine, but at least the horsepower of the internal combustion engine because people aren't going to take the car which is very fast and powerful powered by fossil fuels and switch to a solar powered car that drives at you know 50 kilometers an hour maximum okay it's not going to happen and when the cloud comes in front of the sun if you don't have a good battery the car is not going to function well right no you've got to have something approximating a car so then they thought okay let's have let's have electric cars now, of course, electricity is going to be powered by something. Um, but, you know, you can power electricity by hydroelectric, by solar, by things that are renewable. You know, you don't have a non-renewable source necessarily, like you have gasoline for an internal combustion engine. So let's get electric cars. Well, then you need batteries. If you need batteries, you're going to discover that you enter not into a green economy, a clean economy, but very dirty economy because you're going to need to exploit cobalt, copper, and so on, you know, from Zambia, from Chile, from you know, countries where the, the mining of this stuff is quite hideous. Um, now, I'm not against the mining of, you know, minerals and so on. You need them for the modern world, but you, it's not a necessarily easy substitute to go from a fossil fuel-driven car to um, an electric car. But look what happened in this discussion. We moved from one form of energy to the other. But the car remains in the debate. Why car? Why do we need a car? Why don't we say we don't need private transportation? Private transportation is expensive. It's, it's ridiculous. It's, it's wasteful. Why don't we just try to move as much as possible to better public transport that's powered by, for instance, electricity? And you don't even need batteries because if you had good quality trams, for instance, you could run them on a, on a line, on an electric line. You don't even need batteries. But you could run, let's say, you know, buses with batteries. They have good quality batteries now. You can run a bus on a battery. That's fine. But you collectivize and socialize transportation. Much better way of doing things. Similarly, you know, uh, what's a great way to do the green uh, transformation? Well, let's recycle. Uh, things. You know, let's not throw away plastic and this, that, and the other. Um, let's have a better energy source to heat houses. Houses, that's another anachronistic thing. Why do we need to live in detached homes? Why can't we live more in much more dense housing, like in, in apartment buildings? 
the greater the density, the less energy needed to heat each detached home. So very interestingly, just in these practical things, I'm giving you some practical examples. Just on this very practical, on the, on the very practical plane of discussion, the move from fossil fuel to a renewable form of energy is not being thought about as a move from a certain way of life, you know, a way of life which is individualized, privatized, and so on, to a more collective form of life. Why? It's nothing to do with the fact that, you know, I, I have a, um, a preference for socialism or anything. It's nothing to do with that. It's just logical for energy consumption. You know, people who studied this will tell you that the denser living people do, the lower the energy footprint, you know, and, and so on. So part of the sham of the Green New Deal is that the Green New Deal, and I'm not even talking about production, I'm just talking about consumption. The Green New Deal maintains the forms of consumption that were set up because of fossil fuel advantages. The fossil fuel, when we harnessed fossil fuel, it actually enabled us to have private cars. Now, when you're transitioning away from fossil fuel, why are you carrying that over to the renewable transportation sector? Why not rethink transportation? You know, imagine an Italian city. My God, this is hard in Italy um, because it's not only cars. You have to rethink the use of the Vespa and the little more, you know, motor scooters and things like that. Um, you know, but although those are not enormous energy consumers, um, but still imagine a major Italian city. There's just no cars there anymore. You know, it's not noisy. You have more public transport, trams running through the city, you know, more walking, more bicycling. We'll be healthier as people. You know, we'll take advantage of the fact that we are filled with energy. We humans are filled with energy. I've always found it bizarre that people in the richer countries leave their detached homes, get into their cars, drive to the gym, and then go to the gym and in a machine which uses energy, they walk. Why don't you just walk to the somewhere? Why do you need to drive to the gym and then use an an electricity driven walking machine that strikes me as another sign of our civilizational insanity but that's where we are so let's go back to the present and to what's not working in the present let's talk about the green climate fund uh, that's this huge fund that is often presented as a way to allow a, a fair and just transition in the global south. Is it really like that? Is it working? And why is it? Or why is it not? Where is it? I mean, where, where is this green climate fund? Where, where is it? I mean, who, who controls it? I, I'd, li I'd like to see the balance sheet. Uh, you know, what's the incoming? Uh, where is it coming from? It's, it's pathetic, you know, honestly. Um, every COP, there's a pledge made by the richer countries that they're going to finance this fund to help mitigation and transition. Mitigation, because there are some countries and some populations that are immediately going to experience really hard time. Like, for instance, low, you know, small island states might need to build a wall around the island to prevent, you know, erosion um, and so on. Who's going to fund that? That's not a hugely expensive thing, but still needs funding. These countries don't have the money. That was supposed to come from this fund, mitigation. And then to help the transition, you know, um, get rid of all your, your, um, your fossil fuel driven buses in a city and, you know, convert the buses into, um, into, you know, electric buses and so on, natural gas buses, perhaps even better. Um, where's the money? It, they make promises and they don't deliver. You know, there's $32 trillion sitting in illicit tax havens, illegal tax havens. $32 trillion, and that's only an estimate, probably more than that. $32 trillion, trillions of dollars a year spent on weapon systems, trillions of dollars. And they can't even come up with one and, or maybe even $2 billion for the Green Fund, you know, the Climate Fund. I mean, it's it's ridiculous. You know, what are your priorities? 
um, what are the priorities? Look at the debate in Europe now. It's, it's crazy. I mean, in Europe now, the principal debate is whether European countries must accelerate to have their defense spending be at 2% of GDP, right? That's the debate. Um, many European countries, as a consequence of the European Central Bank rules, cannot um, make a, a, a expenditure so that their debt to GDP ratio goes out of control. They have to control the ratio of their debt to their total production of goods and services. That's These are two problems. You've got a 2% to GDP um, defense spending that you're supposed to do, and you've got a break on the debt to GDP ratio. So then where are you going to fund the increased defense spending? You have to do austerity. You have to cut education. You have to cut health care. In that climate, who's going to fund for the green transition? Where is the money going to come from? You know, why isn't there a 2% of GDP compulsion for the green fund. You know, why is it more important to have a 2% compulsion for NATO spending effectively than a 2% for prevention of the climate's catastrophe? I mean, it, it's an interesting, you know, depiction of the morals, you know, not, not just the values, the morals of the high leadership in European countries. You know, um, you know this, for instance, the war in Ukraine, I mean, how long is this going to go? Um, it's not going to, the situation on the battlefield isn't going to change much. This is precisely when you must start negotiating. Even the Pope, right? Even the Pope has called for negotiation in Ukraine. Stop wasting money on that. Start putting genuine money on a green transition and start moving towards a more efficient, say, you know, consumption of energy, much more efficient consumption of energy. For industry, for instance, not just for personal consumption, but in the production sector. Um, you see, it's very easy. Right now, European countries say China is producing so many greenhouse gases. China is producing this, that. But also China is producing for you. You see, China isn't producing for itself. It's the workshop of the world. If you actually took Italy's imports from China and you import it back into Italy's national calculations, the carbon that it took to produce those goods, Italy's carbon calculation would go way up. Yeah. So we got to think about all these things. You know, young people need to look carefully at all this stuff. I understand that the question of the climate catastrophe is a very emotional thing. But, you know, even when something is emotional, you got to build your politics from the facts. You got to build it from the facts. So, you know, people in Europe, young people, climate activists, Extinction Rebellion and so on, they focus on India and China. Don't get sucked into the nonsense that the European leaders are talking about. That's a false approach. You know, don't, don't start to believe that, oh, well, you gotta, let's go and go to war with China because certainly a war with China might make China um, produce less carbon emission. That's, is that the attitude? That's... NATO's attitude, yeah, that might even be Maloney's attitude. I don't know what Maloney's views are on war against China, but, you know, she was somebody who quickly came under NATO orders. Um, NATO's documents all suggest, well, let's put more pressure on China. But is China the real producer of carbon emissions? Not so. Um, not so. Not if you look at carbon emissions around the world and also what the goods that are imported in, um, you know, you're essentially outsourcing carbon emissions to China. Franch. Yes, I want to talk about impediment to the energy transition because, you know, um, this Green New Deal, the Green Capitalistic New Deal, uh, I don't know you, but I think it remembers a little bit what happened with the uh, COVID crisis because governments uh, delegated all the solution to corporations. And actually, they said to corporations, so we will give you money, so corporations 
uh, received public funds that covered all the production of uh, the vaccine, and then they were allowed to make profit. But this fact that they could make profit actually uh, reduced the possibilities. Because I know it may sound weird, but in order to make a profit, Big Pharma has to use um, the biotechnology for which it uh, owns the patent. So um, it reduces the, possi the possible solution, the possible vaccine. And uh, moreover, uh, because of this competition, um, the corporation couldn't share the knowledge. So there were a lot of fails in the production of the vaccine. So the result was this uh, mRNA vaccine that were good for the West, but not for all the rest, because they were way too expensive, they were difficult to conserve. So the result was that only a part of the global population was vaccinated. And I mean, this is not just unfair, but it's also stupid, <laughs> because if you want to uh, limit a global infection using a vaccine, you should vaccinate everyone in the world. And that was done, was done for smallpox, it was done for polio, but in this case, they didn't want to. So my question is, is this kind of uh, capitalism adequate to solve a global crisis? Because global crises, um, you know, require um, cooperation, planification, and Honestly, I don't think that the, the anarchy that there is inside this kind of capitalism um, could solve the problem. Yeah, so your example of um, the pharmaceutical industry is a very good example. So let's, let's make two points out of that. Number one, most of the major um, infrastructural breakthroughs that have taken place in the last 200 years, okay? We're thinking about, let's say, transportation, you know, the digital economy, um, weapons systems, also a form of infrastructure, um, pharmaceuticals and so on. All of these, all of them were funded by government funding, all of them. Weapons systems, um, if you go and look at, let's say, modern weapons companies, Boeing, all American, Boeing, Lockheed, Northrop Grumman and so on, all of them relied on steady um, contracts from the US government and from foreign governments, all of them. Um, digital economy, the digital economy was entirely underwritten by governments, almost entirely. They built the infrastructure, including undersea cables and so on. Later private companies came and took over either running management or they bought them. But initially, it was all government infrastructure, all of them. I can't think of one major modern infrastructural sector that has not been built by, one way or the other, government financing. I mean, pharmaceuticals is very interesting because pharma patents drugs, but all the scientific research for the drugs typically happens with government financing, even in the United States, where it's the National Science Foundation, National Institute for Health and so on, that fund laboratories at the major universities. Once they start making a breakthrough, Big Pharma comes in and puts money in and buys the patent. Um, so this is just a general statement. Like, I don't understand how we suddenly got into a debate in green technology thinking, oh, in this case, private capital will fund it. You know, venture capital, this whole dream, fantasy, of venture capital, VC, vulture capital, really, not venture capital. They are more vulture capital. You know, in Silicon Valley, um, Silicon Valley Bank, you know, which went broke recently. I don't know if you followed that. Um, these companies, basically, um, most of them, uh, the banks and so on, most of them uh, have a very difficult situation because they don't have the kind of capital needed to build undersea cables and so on. Um, they have the capital needed for um, to leverage towards mergers and acquisitions, uh, not necessarily, you know, full-time purchases. Okay, 
So that's one thing I would say, which is important, that history has shown us that big infrastructure projects, it's not, it's not the private capital that comes in. Okay, second point on this, reflecting on this, is that private capital, in fact, um, you know, the history of private capital, in the case of green energy, has not demonstrated itself to be very vigorous. Um, there are some venture capital funds for green energy. But again, they are doing exactly what they did previously, which is they're looking for near breakthroughs and coming in to acquire them. But they are not financing the research needed to see if you're going to have a breakthrough, if you follow what I mean. You see, it's one thing for even Microsoft, which is really a big mergers and acquisitions company. It's one thing for Microsoft um, to come in and buy a startup, which has already you know, developed a product that works. But who is going to fund the thousand startups with all kinds of crazy ideas? Um, in the ecology today, they are largely funded again by some government financing. In the case of the um, digital economy in Israel, United States, and it's all funded by the military. Um, you know, in, in the United States, the military underwrites a lot of startups where there's some application which could be used for surveillance or, or search engines and so on. Um, Google is largely underwritten by the US military. A huge amount of military funding. That's government funding. That's not private capital. So why do we now believe that when it comes to the climate, private funding is going to show up. It's just not going to show up. It hasn't shown up historically. There's no sign of it showing up now. And I don't think we should rely on it. I want to ask you something about governance. Uh, governments uh, talks a lot about climate crisis. Sometimes they do it uh, in institutions that are reserved to rich countries, such as G7 or Davos Forum. And sometimes they do it in multilater multilateral institutions, such as COPS, which is the main one. Uh, do you think COPS are useful for the Global South? And do you have a faith in COPS? Huh, that's interesting. Um... A huge question. Is, yeah, yeah. No, what is the COP? That's an interesting issue. What is the COP? Um, so, COP effectively is, you know, a treaty obligation. Okay, it's something that has to be held uh, because it is a conference of parties to a treaty. Okay, so if they don't hold a COP, it's in violation of a treaty. So one should be very clear. It's not like you know, these countries are coming to the meetings out of some enormous enthusiasm. OK, that's one. Secondly, who pays for the COP? Um, it's an extremely expensive endeavor. And typically, it's underwritten by energy companies. OK, so most of the financing to hold the COP itself is large fossil fuel companies that claim to be transitioning. So. You already now got a problem. The COP is not something that countries are coming to enthusiastically. They have to come there. Okay, it's part of their obligation to the treaty. Um, and secondly, the checks are being cut by large energy companies, many of them still making the bulk of their profit from fossil fuels. So I don't think the COP by itself, okay, is an instrument of anything. Because over the course of the last, you know, two and a half decades, at each COP, there's an agreement. We just talked about the climate fund. There's an agreement. Let's, let's you know, finance the transition and so on. Nobody really meets those goals. Um, there's a lot of grandstanding, you know, a lot of chit chat. The COPs that I've been to, you always run into um, executives of oil companies and so on. They're all over the place. Yeah. So, I mean, what is it? I mean, what is going on here? Um, there's a bit of a sham when it comes to the cops. Absolutely, I agree. Can it be recuperated? Um, that's a question, you know. I mean, it depends. The balance of forces right now in these meetings is held by the Western countries, the global north. They hold the balance of forces. They set the agenda. It's a small part of the world population, okay? It's not a majority of the world's people. 
It's not even necessarily the fastest growing countries in the world. Those are in Asia. Those are India, China, Indonesia, and so on. Will it be that in two, three, four, five years, the Asian countries start setting the agenda for COP? If Asian countries start to set the agenda for COP, what will happen then? Will the Europeans and United States come willingly? Or will they start to send you know, the deputy undersecretary of the environmental ministry? Um, will you no longer see prime ministers and presidents show up? Because, you know, there are lots of other mandated treaty conferences that are held every year by the UN where these low government officials are sent, customs, you know, and so on. Low government officials are sent. COP right now has got a certain glamour because there's a constituency in most countries that thinks of the environmental question or the climate question as important enough when they go and vote or when they go and, you know, exercise their political rights, right? So if, for instance, the Italian prime minister says, I'm not going to COP anymore. Well, maybe in Italy it won't hurt her, but there's going to be a section of the voting public that will be absolutely outraged that she didn't take the COP seriously. Do you understand? So in that sense, the COP is, is a kind of a hollow shell, I must say. You know, I, I'm, I don't have a... 100% negative attitude of the United Nations. But in the case of, of this particular meeting, it has to happen because of the treaty and the outcomes are limited. So why bother, you know, especially given that it's essentially funded by the oil companies? So, uh, last question, at least for me, is... Um, are you optimistic about the climate crisis? Do you think that we will get a solution to this crisis or not? I mean, look, firstly, I think we're all human beings talking to each other here, right? I think so. You never know. Um, at the end of this call, somebody might remove their mask and that's it. Um, but if we're human beings, that's, you know, thousands of years of history of grand human optimism. Uh, humans have been through a lot of stuff, you know, and remain to some extent on balance optimistic, yeah? Um, of course I'm optimistic, you know, because I, I want to live till tomorrow and day after and the following days, you know, that produces its own dynamic for optimism. That's not enough. Um, it's also true, and I know in saying this, some people, might say, well, what a nutty thing to say. But it's also true that human ingenuity is quite impressive. And humans are able to come up with very impressive things. So who knows, in a year, two years, five years, humans come up with some fascinating new technologies, you know, um, new ways of harnessing energy, which is not only renewable, but easy to harness. You know, right now, renewable energy is not easy. Um, okay, it is easy to get energy from hydroelectric or solar, but you need batteries. Can we get to a post-battery situation where we don't have to have, you know, the use of, of um, extremely, uh, you know, difficult situation like the lithium industry and so on? What happens there? Humans are, have ingenuity and not just Europeans. You know, in Bolivia, the Bolivians, in a collaboration with the Chinese, um, developed an electric car, a very little electric car, very cute electric car. Evo Morales was the president at the time, and he drove that car out of the factory. Within a few months, he was out of office through a coup d'etat. Imagine, you know, the Bolivians come up with um, an interesting indigenously developed battery, you know, that uses lithium because they produce a lot of it, but gets cleaner and cleaner over time because of technological improvements. And they put that on buses and run their buses with the electric batteries that they're producing. We don't know what kind of ingenuity, uh, you know, is, is sitting in the hearts of humans. That's the second thing. You know, one is we are optimistic by nature. But second, I believe that there could be all kinds of interesting technological breakthroughs. Number three, the climate issue is part of a much broader issue of disenchantment with the people in power, whether it's the genocidal war in Gaza, you know, whether it's the ridiculous conflict in Ukraine, which is going on and on, the very 
um, poor spending decisions made by capitalist governments. You know, austerity. Yes, uh, we'll have a we'll pay off our wealthy bondholders before we allow children to eat and so on. This is beginning to disenchant people around the world. Um, young people marching against the Israeli war is it's an extraordinary sight. I watched the video in Italy of young high school students marching and then the police beating them savagely, you know, a savage beating by the police. That's disenchanting. So it's not just on climate, on so many issues. People are just saying, look, enough is enough. These governments are useless. Now, the problem is that that's a feeling. How are you going to put that feeling into practice? What is it going to mean? You know, you can't just run candidates. Um, a country like Italy, you can't just run candidates against the ruling establishment, even the right wing, which is established itself. You don't have the money for it. You know, you've got to have big ideas, compelling ideas. The right wing has a compelling idea. You know, stop the migrants from entering the country. That's a very, that's a one sentence compelling idea. I don't agree with it at all, but it's a compelling idea. What is our idea? You know, when we go to the people, what are we saying? We are critical of everybody else. But what is our positive idea? We want the planet to be thriving. We want your children to be able to eat, study, you know, become better people. Yeah. We want our cities to be alive. We don't want climate catastrophe. We want more public transport, public parks, right? Opportunities for children to go to a library and so on. Um, so part of this third aspect is there's a disenchantment with the bourgeois leadership, but we haven't come in and taken that space yet. And that I think is something for us to consider is that what is our project for the people? Do we have a project? It's not enough to be against everybody else. What do you stand for? You know, we are for a ceasefire in Gaza. That's easy. Not easy to establish, but easy to articulate. On the climate issue, it's much harder. What are you going to argue for? I would say in a you know, richer country, argue for more public goods, less private goods. You see, recycling is one thing. You know, in, in Santiago, where I live, just across the road is the municipality. In the municipality, they have a vending machine where I can take a bottle and go and fill detergent, you know, lawn to wash dishes and things. There are vending machines for all this stuff all over the place. Um, less recycling, more reusing, you know, repurposing things. Capitalism doesn't want you to reuse and, and repurpose and repair. They want you to throw away and buy again because that's the nature of capitalism. But I think we have a compelling argument to make, which is against capitalism's destruction of the planet. More repair, more reuse. Grow the GDP in a different way. You know, by not buying plastic all every day, you're not dec decreasing the GDP. You, the GDP can increase by me going and filling up detergent from a vending machine. You know, that's also uh, an enhancement of economic activity. Uh, so you don't have to be buying plastic goods and, you know, frozen meals and things like that. First, it's horrible for you to be eating that. And secondly, it creates so much waste right? Processed food and so on. But we need a compelling story. And I would be optimistic if our young politicians produced an optimistic, compelling argument for what is a better pay way to live in this world. Lorenzo, do you have a last question for Vijay before greeting him? For me, it's fine. If you're one, if not, I'm fine. I'm okay. So thank you, Vijay, a lot. I'll, I'll see you next time to talk about uh, hyperimperialism. That is a promise. Perfect. Perfect. And uh, Perfect. thank Perfect. you, Francesca and Lorenzo, for uh, organizing this interview. And uh, thank, thank you. To thanks, you. thanks a lot, guys. Yeah. To all the Ottoliners for uh, following us. And uh, please subscribe our <laughs> channel uh, in, in Italian, uh, in English, in Japanese, in uh, every language do you prefer. And uh, have a thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much.